Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings, and we are here at Modern Day Marine on Day 3 recording, and my guest is the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric Smith. General, welcome to the show, and thanks for stopping by. Thanks a lot, Bill. Appreciate you this letting me do this. And uh, I think our readers and our listeners know very well that you've been nominated to be the next Commandant. You've started or at least gone through some of the Senate process, but you know there's a hold on a lot of FOGO uh, nominations and those sort of things, but we hope everything goes well for you. Thanks. All you're, you're waiting on Senate confirmation to hopefully be General Berger's uh, successor. Yeah, that's uh, the current current status is uh, voted out of the Senate Armed Services Committee and now just on the floor waiting waiting for a vote, whatever the Senate determines. Uh, and as you said, there are there's a hold on all general and flag officer nominations. So, you know, we, we serve the Constitution, so the the Constitution will work itself out, and uh, we're in full support. Well, sir, you've written for proceedings and been on the show before, yeah. uh, and you wanted to stop by today to talk yeah. about talent management, about yes. manpower, recruiting, retention. Um, our, our readers and our listeners know that uh, last year in November, uh, General Berger wrote an article about uh, manpower, recruiting, yeah. retention, not just for the Marine Corps as challenges, but across the joint force. Yeah. And I, I understand the Marine Corps is actually having a pretty good year for both recruiting and, and retention right now. Uh, but, you know, General Berger in that article, he wrote about, you know, some of the challenges, you know, that 25 to 30 percent of American young people are eligible to serve in the military these days because of, you know, uh, weight control issues, some medical issues, sure. you know, criminal records, et cetera. Uh, you know, as a senior leader, as a you know, future member of the Joint Chiefs, et cetera, how, how, how do you address those challenges? How do you get it so that the propensity to serve is larger and the pool of potential recruits is larger? Well, I would say uh, as a senior leader in the Marine Corps, there's, there's an answer. And then um, there's a joint answer. As a service vice chief, um, I would say the following. On the, on the joint answer, it is the call to service, the national call to service. And that has to really resonate uh, across the country and has to emanate, I would argue, from here. It, it is, uh, respectfully, it's, it's members of Congress, um, it is governors, it's local school boards, it's a call to national service. And whether you join the Marine Corps, military in general, uh, the Peace Corps, whether you're a police officer, firefighter, a nurse, a school teacher, that call to service is vitally important because a rising tide does float all boats. And then on the, on the Marine Corps specific side, I think what we have to do is, is continue to hammer home the point that if you join the Marine Corps, the audio and the visual will match. We are not changing our standards for you. We're not uh, here to have a, you know, quote Burger King moment, have it any way you want. If you wish to attempt to become a United States Marine, these are the standards. Meet them and you're a Marine. Fail to meet them and you can't be a Marine. The audio and the visual will match. The experience that we talk to you about will match what you find in the fleet. And it's it's my responsibility as the assistant commandant, and if confirmed as a commandant, it would be my responsibility to guarantee that. that the young 18-year-old signed up to be a Marine and to be a jet mechanic. That experience should be what I said it was going to be when they signed up. I'm responsible for that. We heard from uh, Sergeant Major Jake Reif, who's at mm -hmm. DNI now, yeah, and he's true. headed over to Manpower Reserve Affairs. He serves on our editorial board. Uh, he mentioned that uh, so far, 20, um, fiscal year 2023, right, Marine Corps over 100 percent on, on retention. And he said, uh, you know, the Marine Corps brand, if you will, right, doing right. pretty well. Doing well. I think the message there is we, we try to meet our recruiting goal, as you said, <clears throat> and retention goal, the fiscal year, by October. We met our retention goal in about March of this year. Wow. Because once you see the Marine Corps, once you know the Marine Corps, you like what you see. Because again, the audio and visual match. The goal is to make sure that more Americans have contact with the Marine Corps, which is why we need the local uh, school boards and, and superintendents to to allow us to offer to students what we have to offer. Uh, if they don't wish to take it, then that's fine. But we, we offer leadership. We offer challenge. We offer the ability to work as a team. We offer being a military police officer, to being uh, a jet mechanic, as I said, to being a logistician. And the proof's in the pudding. The Marines are voting with their feet, and their feet are staying put. 
because they want to stay, because of the health care benefits, because of the pay, because of the ability to see the rest of the world. They like what they see and they like the leadership. They don't love everything about it because we're always trying to be better. But we made our retention goal in March, and we will be the only, we're the only service that made it last year. I'm going to confirm that. Uh, we made it last year. I don't think anyone else made it. We will make our recruiting goal this year, and I believe we'll be the only ones that make it. Again, because wow. audio and visual matches. Or you're retaining more second and beyond mm -hmm. uh, second tour Marines, right? Uh, historically, sure. um, you know, the Marine Corps was the youngest service yes. with the highest percentage of first term enlistees and you know, an expectation that about 70 or 80 percent of Marines would sort of turn over every year, right? So as you retain more, as you have an older force, uh, it's more experienced, it's better trained, it's, you're, you're retaining that education. Right. What are some of the you know, uh, second order effects of that that are both positive and, and perhaps challenging? I'll give you the positive. Um, because in my opinion, they're all positive. We have historically had a gap between the five and nine or 10 year mark. Because Marines, as you said, three out of four Marines would serve for four years and go on. And we were very proud of that. We're young, we've high turnover. When you're talking about an environment where it is harder to convince people that what we offer is really good and, and to attract them, you don't want people to come in one term and leave, and leave. 75%. That's, that's nuts. It's also more and more difficult against a peer threat. I mean, state on state conflict to have someone who serves for four years and then leaves when that individual's schooling may take almost two years. And then you only get 18 months to two years of work after the MOS, military occupation especially, is assigned. So we want them to stay for a second term. We're not saying we want every Marine to stay for 30, because we don't, frankly. Right. Um, we want them to stay. Instead of getting out at age 22, we want you to stay until you're 28. And people say, oh, you're, you're aging the force. We would say I'm maturing. But 28, <laughs> as you and I both know, 28 is your physical peak. Right. That is when you are absolutely ironclad. You're mentally and physically at your peak. So that maturation of the force doesn't mean, oh, the force is too old. They're, they won't charge machine guns. Tell that to Mike Strank, the grand old man who was killed on Iwo Jima at the flag raising at about age 25, 26, I think. I got to confirm. But that's my strength. And I, and I, I met his relatives uh, at, what, at what would have been his 100th birthday. Um, he was in his mid, late 20s. That's peak. The other thing that people have to realize is we have a thing now called the blended retirement system. What you and I remember, right. you had to stay for 20 to have any retirement. So once you were beyond 15 years, we kind of had you. Yeah. We could send you anywhere even we want. 10, 11, even right, 10. Even right. 10. Because you were hooked and you yeah. had to stay another 5 to 10. They don't have that now. They have a blended retirement system, kind of a, uh, the civilian version of a 401k. So at the 10 year mark, if they decide, you know, I don't, I don't think this is an organization that, that I want to be part of anymore, they can walk away and take a nest egg with them. Right. That's what I think some critics of maturing the force don't understand. That's different. And we have to recruit. The world that we're in, not the world we wish we were in. Yeah, and they can still stay until 20 and beyond. Absolutely, and have and, retirement. And get a retirement. It's a slightly reduced off the, right. what, what you and so I have. To offset the 401k. Right? Instead of 2% times X number of years, it's or instead of 2.5%, now it's 2%. But yeah. as you said, you've got a 401k, it's called TSP. TSP. you got a government match up to a certain number of dollars. The government matches dollar for dollar and then 50%. Right. So and you it, get your GI Bill and all yeah, the other benefits. Right, right. So there's some significant benefits, and you yeah. can stay for 20 or you can get out of 10 and you, right. you walk with some good benefits. And, and it's our job to convince you, you want to stay for another five. But that's on us. Right. In the news recently, 4th Recruit Training Battalion mm -hmm. down at Paris Island, yeah. that was the uh, Recruit Training Battalion that that historically uh, trained women. That's right? right. Women Marines went through their own battalion. That's correct. That was disestablished. Right. right? Folded the case brought, the colors. Brought down the case the colors. Right. So now you got three battalions there at Paris Island training men and women That's right. integrated at the company level. That's right. How's it going? Um, what's what have you learned? And and uh, are any changes coming? You know, in the next year or two, based on what's happened in the past year. So the, they're also doing that at San Diego, which a lot of people don't really realize. We're, we're doing integrated companies at San Diego as well. 
Um, fourth Recruit Training Battalion, storied battalion. I mean, a, a massive part of our history. We have trained female Marines in various organizations, not always Fourth Recruit Training Battalion, but for the last 30 years, Fourth Recruit Training Battalion. So when it cased its colors, it cannot just be a, oh, here's a small panel in a museum that talks about that history. That is a significant emotional part of our Marine Corps history. We view it as that is no longer required for the future because we fight as integrated teams. I had female Marines work for me in Afghanistan. Everybody takes the same risks, etc. So females flying combat aircraft, female crew chiefs, female artillery officers, female infantry officers. Marina Hyrell was one of my uh, infantry officers when I was first Marine Division. And, um, and she, she was tough. I mean, she was tough. A phenomenal officer. Um, we, we don't need that battalion anymore because we are integrated and yep. it didn't change standards. And people who were unhappy about, about that from either side, this is what modernization looks like. And the only thing that's constant is change. And it was a really well done ceremony and there was a lot of pride poured out by the veterans of 4th Recruit Chain Battalion. Major General Bobby Shea, who both went through it and commanded it, yeah. was the guest speaker. And man, note to self, don't follow Bobby Shea as a speaker because it won't go well for you. Huh. But for us, that is a, a step forward because we will fight as a team in peer-on-peer -peer competition, males and females, uh, everybody doing their job, everybody pulling the trigger. I listened to a, a panel discussion of uh, Marine generals the other day talking about training and, and educating the force, right? right? I walk around here, modern-day Marine, walking the floor the last couple of days. It's a really high-tech stuff, and that's yeah. just the unclassified stuff that we can see. Yeah. You know, lots of UASs, right, unmanned air systems, from little things that you can go like this to MQ-9s hanging from the rafters, right? Quadcopters to fixed wing to... Uh, I mean, re really impressive tech. Yeah. Uh, you know, one company was showing a hydrogen fuel cell that you can take into the field to power yeah. your talk. Fascinating, isn't it? right? Yeah, just amazing stuff. So uh, I heard that the School of Infantry is now three weeks longer than it used to be. Right. I heard actually, the, uh, even longer than that. Um, it's actually about. Uh, I think it's actually more than four. More than four. I got to get the number right. There's 70 training days, so it's almost doubled. Wow. And it's total training. I think it was from 8 to 14, if I'm not mistaken. But it's, it's 70 training days yep. from about uh, 38 training days. Okay. It's way longer, and it's trained differently. The entire squad starts and ends in the squad with one instructor. And uh, somebody mentioned that, you know, if that squad, when they graduate, instead of being shotgunned out to multiple different battalions, they, the same battalion. they all go to one battalion together. They train right. together. They serve together. Right. Yeah. Um, so on the training and education perspective, I mean, you, you've got higher technology, you've got Marines being able to reach out the, to the adversary at farther ranges and with, right. with new technology. Training them, getting, that, getting, getting the, uh, the money back on the training, how do you keep up, how does the schoolhouse keep up with the technology, yeah. right? And then, um, uh, you know, how do you educate, I heard one of the generals said, you know, we're training Marines today for the fight tonight. We're educating them for the fight, you know, two years, three years, five years exactly down the road, right? right? So uh, talk a little bit about, you know, that training and education uh, investment that you've got to make in the individual Marine, officer and enlisted. Yeah, it's a great, great question. You have to train them to fight in an austere environment when they are disaggregated and they must make decisions on their own without constant communication back to hire. You know, over time, if you look at history, if you look at how a phalanx formed, in the Roman legions, and then you look at how we fought in the Civil War, and even how we fought at Bellowood, and then how we fought in World War II, and then went into to Korea and Vietnam, you get, you, we are getting more disaggregated because the firepower enables you to, to spread out and cover more frontage, so to speak. You have to train people and educate them that that is coming. So fight tonight, tomorrow, but tra uh, educate for the future. In five years, we could see Marines even more disaggregated, you have to be trained to operate alone as a gunnery sergeant, not to operate with a, a, a quick reaction force 10 minutes away. Yep. As we did, frankly, for 15 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and as a vet of Afghanistan and Iraq, taking nothing away from, from my counterparts, it's going to be a different fight next. So you train with the high-end systems 
to get maximum number of repetitions. That comes from some of the industry partners here giving us um, uh, simulators that are, that are embedded within the equipment. For example, the ACV, the, the amphibious combat vehicle, I don't want a simulator. I want to train in my ACV when it's parked. Yep. Now, we'll take a simulator on the way to a, a better system that allows me to train in my same truck, my same vehicle, on my same weapon system, um, and to train in a, in a virtual environment that is free from overhead collection of an adversary, but that I can use the full suite of tools in that radio. That's the training, and as was said, the education piece is teaching those young captains, when you become a battalion commander, you have to push the edge. You have to push further than you think you can go. You have to think to be able to operate independently when cut off from your communications because a future adversary can deny your communications for 36 hours at a time, 96 hours at a time. Can you still function that way? We've done it in the past. I would say we did it at the Chosen Reservoir, largely cut off. Sure. We can do that again. We just want to be prepared best to do that before it happens. So it is a blend of training and education. And General Imes, Lieutenant General Imes, who runs Training Education Command, has, in my opinion, done a phenomenal job of beginning the education process while immediately focusing on the training part. Yeah, I think uh, the General said something like 60-plus thousand Marines are going through training or education programs every year. So every year. about a third of the force is constantly doing that, right? Right. Learning new skills, being being educated. That's, that's yeah. a pretty massive schoolhouse endeavor, if you will. It, it, it is massive, and we have a higher, we call it T2P2, but this is, you know, training, trainees, transients, yep. et cetera, patients. Um, but that's an investment. And if you're a professional organization, you invest. We, we have one of the best professional mil military education programs in the Marine Corps. On the officer and enlisted side, if you are not PME complete, you don't get promoted. You don't. And I, I, that began uh, under General Krulak, who, who said, if you don't get promoted, or if you don't complete your PME, we won't promote you. And then we actually didn't promote people when they didn't go to school. And now they go to school. The non-resident program or the resident program. I, I hear that a 360 degree review process mm -hmm. is coming to the Marine Corps. Right? Yes. Will that will that be something that um, enters into official records and actually has an impact on promotion boards, or is it going to be something that you know starts off as a as a training or a, a you know, professional development tool, but but doesn't really get into your professional record and impact your promotion and your yeah. selection to command and, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. So there's two boards, statutory, non-statutory. Yep. A promotion board is statutory by law. Um, a command board is non-statutory. You have no right to command. You have no right to to, to lead Marines, if you yep. will. I, 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 my personal assessment, I do not see a 360 eval ever being used as a promotion tool. Because the, the person who sees you, your boss, should have the ability... To, to, to know about you, uh, you know, how do you cooperate with your peers and how do your subordinates think, but will there always be an outlier who says, I hate that guy, I hate that woman, she's terrible. Right, of course they will. So we, we right. get that because it's, it's an anonymous survey. Dangerous ground to use an anonymous survey for a promotion. But yep. for a command board, for example, if 70% of your peers said, uh, you know what, this individual's out for themselves. They're a self-promoter. I, I may want to know that. If we can confirm that the 360 eval, which is why we do a pilot program, right. is valid, it's accurate, one person's not filling out seven forms, those kind of things. If we can validate the data, that's something I may want to know before I say, you know, you should go be in charge of 5,000 Marines. I might want to know that 70% of your peers think you're a self-promoter and you don't care about Marines. Because... The person who's owed something is not the commander. It's always the PFC and the Lance Corporal. They're owed the best leader I can provide them. And if a 360 eval tool enables the, the future commandant, uh, the assistant commandant, me, to, um, to best help select those leaders, then it's a good tool. But I, I think it'll always be a tool, not an enter into your record. Yeah. Fi final thing is most people, when you show them they're doing something good, they will reinforce it, and if it's bad, they will try to fix it. Yep. Uh, the analogy I use, it, I'm driving down the road. I don't habitually speed, right? I try not to break the law. If I'm driving down the road 
and it's a, a 45. And I am, because I'm talking to my wife or just not paying attention, and I'm doing uh, 52. And they have a little sign that says, speed limit 45, your speed is, and it flashes. Right. When I see 52, whoa, yeah. I slow down. Sure. Because I'm trying to do the right thing. Sometimes if you just show people, hey, you know everybody else thinks that you're a self-promoter or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Most people will actually know themselves and seek self-improvement, one of our leadership principles. I, I believe that. Most people are good. Got it. So pilot program. Pilot program. Uh, it's already being mm -hmm. used. and being used. How, how broadly? Very small. Uh, tens okay. of, of individuals, uh, many tens, but tens, to be expanded more more widely after the results of the pilot program come in. So this, let's take a look at all of our lieutenant colonels. Let's take a look at our uh, gunnies one day. Who should be a first sergeant, mass sergeant? Who shouldn't be a first sergeant, or mass sergeant? Yeah. And we'll expand it as widely as we think it's practical and useful. But first, we need to see the results. If it proves no value, then we won't do it. I think it'll prove some value. And who's who's running that program? Is that under TCOM or? It's under Lieutenant General Glenn at Manpower Reserve Affairs. Got it. So because okay. it's it is a personnel tool, and uh, we we think that we we should never see a commander, and it's mostly I'll tell you about command climate. We should never see a commander relieved for bad command climate. At the lieutenant colonel level, we should have seen that coming. Yeah. How did we not? Because we have a blind spot. Right. Right. Because our current fitness support system doesn't necessarily show you subordinate what, what, and peer. What the peers think and the subordinates So maybe think. if we knew that, and again, we don't relieve many. We may relieve a couple, three officers in a year because yeah. we get it right 99% of the time. But we're Marines. We want 100%. I got it. Last question for you, sir. sir. Um, so, and I think I already know the answer based on something you said uh, 10 minutes ago. Yeah. But there's been uh, a, a lot of talk about highly technical fields, for example, cyber, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of kids who are geniuses at cyber in high school. Yes. And they spend a lot of time doing this. They might spend a lot of time, you know, playing war games on, on computers. Yeah. They might not fit the physical fitness requirements to be a Marine. Right. Um, has, and some services have talked about, you know, lowering standards in some MOSs and, you know, perhaps not everybody has to be, as the Marines have always said, every Marine a rifleman, right? Yeah. Uh, where, where, where is that going uh, in terms of the Marine Corps? That's going nowhere. It's going nowhere, um, okay. If you're a wicked, if you're the best cyber operator in the world and you're awesome and uh, you have exquisite skills and you are not in shape, hey, go see your recruiter. They'll get you in shape. Grab some tennis shoes on the way and uh, get on a pull-up bar, We're, and we'll help you. That's what the Blade Entry Program is about, to help you, because it makes you better. Here's, here's what I know, and the reason I say this on the future battlefield. We won't lower our standards. You have to be physically fit, because we represent America's 911 force, and you have to represent the entire Corps. No one is immune from injury on the battlefield. When I was shot, I was a division operations officer as wow. a lieutenant colonel. That did not stop me from taking a machine gun bullet in the leg, right? And I can tell you that when you are physically fit, you are less likely to go into shock on the battlefield. Medical fact. Um, more able to control your heart rate and, and, and keep yourself from going to a bad place. If it's a, a cyber operator, you say, well, you know, I'm going to be way back in the rear until an adversary missile has a 4,000 kilometer range and can strike you, and then you're not fit and you're not able to survive the rigors of combat. Yeah, Every Marine will have their day in combat. And it doesn't matter what your MOS is, every Marine will find themselves in a situation where they need their rifle to protect their fellow Marine. And if they are wounded, a more physically fit Marine is more survival on the battlefield. That's a medical fact. Been there, done that, can prove it. So if you want to be a Marine, even if it's a cyber operator, grab your shoes, grab your shoes. get a pull-up bar, go see your local recruiter. They'll help you get in shape. Because what we offer is an opportunity to make yourself better and to be part of something bigger than yourselves, support your nation, and to gain a skill as well, but to become a Marine. Because no matter what happens, if you stay for four years, you can always say, I'm a Marine. If you drive down a highway, what stickers on the back of cars? Yeah, it's an Eagle Globe and Anchor. There's a reason for that. You should find out why. Awesome. Well, my guest has been General Eric Smith. He's the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. Sir, thanks for your time. It was great to have you on the show again. Thanks, Bill. Really right. appreciate it. Take care. Semper Fi. Until the next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.